Good morning. I invite you to join me this morning in meditating on the 90th Psalm. I pray and hope that you will be edified. And to that end, I hope that you will use both your eyes and your ears in absorbing, taking in the Word of God, thinking on His things, and meditating on how His Word can change our hearts, our minds, and our lives. We have uh, dozens, literally, of visitors with us this morning, so if you're visiting with us, uh, go meet a member, shake their hand, and welcome them this morning. We, uh, as always, hope that we can be an encouragement to you, and even if you're just passing through, we have several families of members, we want to talk to you too. Maybe you have dirt on one of our people that you can share, or getting to know you, we can get to know our people better, but if you're new to the area, or you're visiting from the community especially, we want to reach out to you, be a family to you, be a home for you, so please Give us a chance to do that, and we have Bible classes immediately following our worship that we pray that all of us will take advantage of. But for now, we turn our attention to the 90th Psalm. Psalm 90 is unique for two reasons, at least, that I will give you before we read it. One is that Psalm 90 is a psalm of wisdom which not very many of the psalms that we have are. You may be familiar with psalms of praise, psalms of lament, psalms of thanksgiving. Psalm 90, we might put in a category called a psalm of wisdom. We know maybe that we go to the books like Proverbs and Ecclesiastes for wisdom. Wisdom meaning in the Hebrew scriptures, the skill of living well. But Psalm 90 speaks to that reflection on the nature of life in this world, and how to live that life well in the fear of the Lord. But if we're going to be receiving wisdom from a scripture, we might want to know who wrote that wisdom, and what credibility they have in offering us wisdom. Which brings us to the second unique thing about Psalm 90, which is, it is the only psalm in our collection attributed to Moses as the author. We don't know exactly, have no real indication, when in Moses' life he penned the words to Psalm 90. But what a life Moses lived. Moses grew up in the palace of the king of the most powerful country, nation, people in the region, in the world at the time. He grew up there, but when he became an adult, chose volunteer, voluntarily to identify with his own people, the, the Hebrew slaves living in the land of Egypt. And it appears from the few things we're told in Scripture that Moses went out trying to start a one-man revolution, killed an Egyptian, before realizing that wasn't going to work, and he became, all of a sudden, a fugitive, fleeing from Egypt to a foreign land, where he lived A quiet life, we might say, for the next 40 years, working as a shepherd and raising a family. Well, at age 80, far from going into retirement, God called on Moses, appearing to him at Mount Sinai in the burning bush, telling him to go back to Egypt. And he went, performed many mighty acts, overthrowing that same superpower in which he was raised. Delivering his people out of Egypt, passing through the Red Sea, into the wilderness where he became their deliverer and their leader. Taking them back to Mount Sinai. Only to go up and see the face of God. Speak with God face to face. Receive the law and then transmit it to the people. But those people did not accept Moses. In fact, they rejected him as they rejected God. And they continually listened, not to what he had to say, but to their own desires, rejecting him. And maybe you would say as a result of that, or at least burdened by that frustration, towards the end of Moses' life, he made a mistake of his own, is the way we might say it. The fact is, Moses sinned. 
and he dishonored God, profaning God's name in the presence of the people. Disobeying God, he was himself forbidden from going into the very promised land that he had been leading the people to all of these years. And so he dies, not in the promised land, but on the top of Mount Pisgah, overseeing the promised land at 120 years of age. What a life Moses lived. Psalm 90, in the title, says Moses is the man of God. Maybe an apt description of him. If anybody could tell us about the nature of God, wouldn't it be Moses, the one who spoke to him face to face? If anybody could tell us about the nature of humanity, wouldn't it be Moses? If anybody had seen life and all of its pain and all of its pleasure, all of its trials and triumphs, if anybody has ascended the mountaintop of the divine and wandered in the wilderness of human depravity and could speak through all of that to give wisdom, it would be Moses. So let's listen and look at what Moses has to say in the 90th Psalm. Let's read it together. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn mankind back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger, terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow. For they quickly pass and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger. Your wrath is as great as the fear of That is your due. Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad. For as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble, may your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us, establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. I'll suggest that we see three movements in Psalm 90. The first two, meditating on the nature of man in light of the nature of God. And then the third movement, a series of pleas or prayers to God. In the first movement, Moses reflects on the eternity of God, the eternality of God compared with the mortality of man. He begins by describing God in ways that bend our mind, that challenge us to even conceive of what he is saying. Can you see all the generation with your mind's eye, see all the generations of humankind? And God has been there through all of that. Can you imagine a time before the mountains were formed 
God was there. And can you conceive of something, in verse 2, that has no beginning from everlasting and has no end to everlasting? That is God. And just as we are floating in the heavens trying to imagine that reality of God's eternal nature, Moses, Moses slams us back down to the earth saying that we, the children of man, are literally earth. We are dust. And God reminds us that we are but dust. From dust you were created, he said in Genesis chapter 3, and to dust you shall return. And in another image, in verses 5 and 6, we, our lives are like the grass, springs up quickly, And dries up just as quickly and fades away. Perhaps the contrast in verse 4 encapsulates this perfectly. A thousand years in your sight, O God, are like a day that has just gone by. God is the God of history. The God of eternity. Time is irrelevant to him. It's meaningless to him. And so a thousand years, a millennia. Not as long as we can conceive, you know, that's a long stretch of time, our largest unit of time. Yet, for God, it's nothing. And that is our lives. They are nothing. They're like the passing of a summer's day when you turn around and think, where did this go? Before you know, before you know it, your life has passed. You're old. Your children are grown. Life fades, and we all are, as Moses says, swept away into the sleep of death. It doesn't get much brighter. In fact, maybe it gets darker in the second movement, as Moses then reflects on God's holiness and God's wrath compared to the iniquity and the sinfulness of man. Our lives are not only short, Moses reminds us, but they are full of sorrow because they are lived in the shadow of God's wrath. Now the picture of Psalm 90, because it fits with the rest of Scripture, is not a picture of an unloving God who sits up in heaven and enjoys torturing people, enjoys bringing on pain just for the sake of hurting His creation. It's different than that. In fact, we might say that what Moses is describing in Psalm 90, the sorrow and the trouble of life, is not because God is unloving or unrighteous, but it's precisely because he is loving and righteous. He is a holy God. He is a God of light, a God of love. And yet we as humans have rebelled against him. And so our sin has become this barrier between the light of God's presence, and us. And so, if you're tracking with the visual I'm presenting, we live in a shadow. A shadow of God's wrath. Sin has separated us from a holy God. And now we live in a broken and fallen world, subject to lives of grief and darkness. So that even the most full lives, 70 years or 80, Moses says, By reason of strength. We might say, but you got 120, Moses. But I think he would say the same thing. Even the best of them, the best of those years are trouble and sorrow. And they are gone quickly. We live out our days in the shadow of God's wrath, living lives of suffering, toil, and of pain. I think we've tried to run away from that. As humans, perhaps that's natural. And in our modern world, I think we try to fool ourselves that all of the improvements in technology and in medicine and in comfort can somehow mask the fact that life is pain. To exist is to suffer. Aside from the fact that we all die, life is always 
today as it was in the days of Moses, full of tragedy and catastrophe, full of war, suffering, oppression, and in our own lives, not to mention sickness and suffering of a physical kind, we experience anxiety, depression, hurt, guilt, regret, insecurity. To exist is to suffer. Life is pain because we live in a broken and fallen world separated from a holy and loving God by our sin. We as mortals live a short and troublesome existence. God is eternal and holy. And so maybe we would think that there is no hope but to despair. Where are we left in such a dismal circumstance? Such a terrifying reality. Well, the third movement of this psalm, explicitly and by implication, I think, gives us the answer to that. Because in spite of where Moses sees us as humans, puny and pathetic in comparison to God, yet still he spends the conclusion of this psalm calling out to God, praying to him, pleading to him. Three things we'll highlight that Moses cries out for. And if there are things to take away from this lesson, so to speak, this would be them. First, Moses says to God, teach us, verse 12, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Here's our idea of wisdom, how to live well. I don't think most people sit down, stop. And ask themselves that question. What does it mean to live the good life? What does it mean to live well? And so the result of that is that most people, I think, are just swept away in some kind of autopilot by the movement of society, going after, carried along after the things that society is seeking after. Pleasure and wealth and all of that. Or maybe some have ask the question and come to the wrong conclusion and say to live life well is to live lives avoiding pain and seeking pleasure. To feel good, to be happy, that is to live the good life. Moses says, teach us to number our days. Moses says to come face to face with our mortality and with our brokenness. That, he says, will give us a heart of wisdom. But that doesn't feel good. I don't think we've gotten the warm and fuzzies so far in Psalm 90, thinking about the imminence of death and the sinfulness and the suffering of our human existence. It does not feel good, but it makes us wiser. It gives us perspective, a perspective of time, perspective of our limited nature, again, in light of God's eternal nature. And with that perspective, perhaps humility to say, well, maybe I don't have all the answers. Maybe our society, as shifting and transient as human life is, maybe our society doesn't have all of the answer. Maybe there is a higher wisdom. And with that humility, and with the acknowledgement of the limitation of our days, the number of days that we have left, as few as they are, perhaps we develop a sense of urgency, a sense of priority. That if I am limited, if I am nothing, if I live but an existence of vapor and grass and dust on this earth, then I want to use those few moments that I have. And I want to build a life not on that which is transient, but that which is lasting. I want to build my life purposefully on that which is good and true and beautiful. This is not a life of happiness that we are seeking, but a life of fullness. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. How can we build a life that is full if we are but grass? Moses says in verse 14, to God, the eternal and holy God, 
Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all of our days. Because God is the source of all, He is the only source, the only hope for any kind of fullness in this life. And though Moses does fear the wrath of God, the holiness of God, he knows that God will have compassion and will pour out his unfailing love on those who orient their hearts and their minds and their lives toward him. Yes, human life is characterized by the swift transition from morning to evening, day to day, year to year, until life comes to an end. But it is perhaps one of the miracles of human existence that we have the capacity to sing in suffering and to be glad even in our affliction. Make us glad, verse 15, for as many days as you have afflicted us, as many years as we have seen trouble. That God can give us gladness and joy and satisfaction and fullness even in the meager lives that we live. How does that happen? One way I think is thinking of our existence as so small, so futile, actually brings, I think, larger into our viewpoint the simple things that God gives us every day. If He is the source of all, and our life is fleeting, then we can be grateful when we wake up in the morning, for waking up in the morning, for the daily bread that He gives us, for the people that we can enjoy our lives with, for the nature that we can see around us, the sun on our face, the clouds in the sky, the simple daily gifts we can appreciate knowing that it all comes from God. We can find gladness in these days of affliction. But is that all there is? Is it just smell the flowers, appreciate the sunshine, and then your life's over before you know it? The conclusion of this psalm, I think, takes us deeper than that, even to something profound. The third and final prayer that we'll highlight in verse 17. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. The word establish actually a word that has connection to the dynasty of kings. It may seem like an odd word for Moses to use as he concludes a psalm that is about passing away like a watch of the night or like grass that sprouts up and then dries up and floats away. We can be established. Of course, this is only because of God and His Work. That's why verse 16 focuses on God's deeds that Moses prays would be shown to his people and to his children. The work of humanity, the existence of humanity, again, is really nothing in the grand scheme of things. And all of human history, all of the history of the planet, it points to God and God's eternal nature, God's divine power. God's reign as king. But, through the grace of God, the favor of the Lord, that he says in verse 17, by the grace of God, he has invited us into a fellowship with him. That in living lives by his commandments, living lives in him, our lives, though they are short and sorrowful, our lives take on an eternal significance. That we, our work, is established by God. Established forever. 
We live, we die, we are forgotten, as Robert reminded us. And yet what we do here matters eternally because God sees us, knows us, and gives meaning and purpose and significance to the lives that we live. And so our lives are not meaningless. The work that we do is not fleeting. The things that we do every day as we work to provide for our families, to love our children, to raise them in a godly way, to be kind, to forgive, to serve others in our communities, to get to know our brothers and sisters, the other people of God, to worship Him as we pray and read and sing every day of the week. All of this, it matters to God. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us, establish the work of our hands, establish the work of our hands. And really, that brings us back to where Moses started. O oh Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Teach us to number our days, to see our limited nature, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Satisfy us with the daily gifts given to us from your unfailing love and establish the work of our hands now and forever. Will you pray with me? O Lord, our God, we are but dust. You are forever. We are sinful. You are holy and just. You, Father, are a refuge. You are the only refuge. You have always been a refuge for your people from generation to generation. And so we join our voices with that of Moses, calling out to you, asking for your compassion, your mercy, asking for your wisdom. We pray that you would shape our hearts, that you would cut out of our hearts the deception of this world, the desires of this passing generation, and that you would root and anchor our hearts through your word and through your spirit to you, to your love, to your truth, that the things we do every day would not be in vain, but would be eternal in their significance. Because we are serving the God of the universe, the God of creation. Father, we humble ourselves before you. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Satisfy us this morning with your steadfast love. And establish the work of our hands. In Jesus we pray. Amen. We close this service, as we do every time we meet together, by offering an invitation. Live for Jesus. Jesus, God in the flesh, showed us the way, showed us what it means to live life well, to live out the wisdom of God, which is to do the will of God, to sacrifice your own self, to do what God commands. And that is the invitation for every single one of us in here, whether we have been baptized and joined that covenant with Jesus or not. The invitation is for us to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and follow Jesus. But in particular, if you have not yet had your sins washed away in the waters of baptism and started down that road, you can give your life eternal significance this morning by joining yourself to our Lord. Being washed away, being, being washed of your sins, being raised to walk in newness of life. Can we help you? Come to the front as we sing this song.